Welcome to History of Health Information Technology in the U.S. History of Privacy and Security Legislation. This is Lecture B, Best Practices for Information Security. The HIPAA security rule that was implemented in 2005 had actually made use of recommendations for best practices that were developed almost a decade earlier. This presentation will review those recommendations. The objective of this lecture, Best Practices for Information Security, is to describe the security recommendations in the 1997 report entitled, For the Record. In 1995, the National Research Council convened a committee to recommend best practices for security of healthcare information. The results of their deliberations were published in 1997 in a book entitled, For the Record. It can be read online at the URL on the screen. You can take a look at the book, which includes the practices we will discuss in this lecture, or at least look at the last chapter on findings and recommendations to see more details on what we will discuss today. The first recommendation is to have individual authentication of users. What this means is that any time anyone accesses the system, you should know exactly who they are, not just that they are in a class of individuals, such as doctor, student, etc. Each person should have a unique identifier. Because passwords are often forgotten, people tend to write them down, and others may use them, making them a very weak form of authentication. Strong authentication procedures can involve several things. One type is biometric, referring to unique biological properties of the individual, such as thumbprints, iris scans, voice prints, etc. Another type often involves two stages, often referred to as something you have and something you know. Something you have might be a smart card with a computer chip with information on it, or a token with a randomly changing ID number. Something you know might be an individual password. Someone who found the token could not use it without the password, and vice versa. In addition, to minimize risks, organizations should be moving to enterprise-wide authentication, where an individual might sign on only one time per session and get access to all that they have a right to see. Determining who has rights to what information requires access controls. That is, certain job titles allow access to certain information and not other information. The billing clerk might be able to see information on procedures done, but not physician notes, for example. There are also software programs for access validation that would allow only authorized information to be presented to certain users. Finally, there need to be audit trails, which are mechanisms for displaying who has accessed the information. Not only do these audit trails need to be in place, in fact, most information systems already have the capability, but also they need to be activated and reviewed regularly, which does not always happen. Ideally, when records are shared among organizations, such as within the entities in an integrated delivery system, the audit trail should span particular facilities. Part of the HIPAA privacy rule also allows patients to know who has accessed their records. The National Research Council also recommended improved authorization forms for use of the information. Before the HIPAA privacy rule was enacted, patients often signed a form for consent to treatment that included a blanket authorization for use of the information with very little restriction on who got it and how it would be used. It was clear that these authorizations needed to be more specific, and now there are more restrictions, as the 1997 report recommended. The practices that we just described relate mainly to confidentiality practices, that is, keeping information only in the hands of those who have a right to see it. In many ways, these practices should be implemented for paper as well as computer-stored information. 
but you can see how hard it would be to maintain controls for paper records. There are other security practices that mainly refer to the information systems in which the information resides. The first of these practices relates to physical security and disaster recovery. This means that unauthorized people are not allowed physical access to the computers or to see the information on them. Improving physical security may be as simple as changing the angles of the computer screens in ambulatory settings so they are not visible to all the patients in the waiting room. In addition, the computers themselves need protection from environmental as well as human dangers. Regular backups, off-site storage of data, and plans for recovery need to be in place. If the system is accessible remotely, there need to be electronic protections against unauthorized access. This should include firewalls and other mechanisms to protect against hackers. You also need to protect external communications. It's almost the reverse of the hacker problem. You not only need to protect against outsiders getting into your system, but you need to protect the information that you send outside the system. If information is to be transmitted externally, it should be encrypted. That is, it needs to be coded so that only the appropriate person can decode the information, and if it is intercepted en route, it cannot be read by unauthorized individuals. There are several methods of encryption, one of which is called Public Key Infrastructure, or PKI. PKI involves two keys, one to encode the message and another to decode it. This is called asymmetric encoding. Each key is a complex set of numbers used to encode or decode the data. The two keys are not identical, but are mathematically related to each other. Suppose you wanted to send a message to someone so that only that person could understand it. The key to encode the message is called that person's public key and is freely available, so anyone can send the person an encoded message. The private key is only known by the recipient of the message, who is the only one who can decode it. The keys are used with computer programs that perform the encryption. Other practices include software discipline. This means that organizations must put policies in place about appropriate software that can be installed on systems. And to protect systems from inappropriate software, virus checking programs also need to be in place. Continuous assessment of the systems also needs to be done to assure that policies are followed and that there are not breaches of security. If caregivers actually enter information into the record, there should be electronic authentication of records, preferably with digital signatures. These are encoded identifiers of the caregivers who have written in the record. So, there is a record of who has entered anything or changed anything. In addition to actual security practices, there also should be policies. There should be explicit security policies that all individuals in the organization are aware of. There should also be security committees as well as an information security officer to oversee the development and implementation of the policies. To assure that all employees are aware of the policies, there will need to be focused education and training programs. Because the healthcare organization will be held responsible for the behavior of its employees, this aspect is particularly crucial. Finally, without some form of penalties for violation of the policies, they will not have any teeth, so it was recommended that sanctions be mandated for violations. This concludes Lecture B of History of Privacy and Security Legislation. In summary, we have discussed the administrative, technical, and physical security safeguards outlined in the book For the Record. Many of these recommendations have been incorporated in the HIPAA security rule. They represent best practices, yet many healthcare organizations have had challenges in implementing them.